everyone, welcome. I'm uh, the moderator today. My name is Sebastian Ogimsta. I'm a senior fellow at uh, Erasmus University Rotterdam, and I'm also uh, re uh, related to an international law firm here in Luxembourg. Today we will speak about uh, pan-European pensions and tontines, and more specifically whether Europe can take a uh, lead in the, in the global discussion. In the goodbye speech of uh, Bernardino, he indicated already that, uh, that occupational pensions, and more specifically the pan-European occupational pensions, would be one of the major topics uh, to uh, address uh, after he would leave. And in this respect, uh, we have two, uh, in this webinar, two speakers which are very distinguished and knowledgeable in the, in the pan-European pension domain, and especially in, the, in this forthcoming discussion. And at the one hand, we have Francesco Briganti, who is uh, Secretary General at CBVA Europe. It's an association which is uh, representing uh, all types of uh, constituencies uh, in Europe. And he will discuss uh, about uh, his uh, proposal of improving the pan-European uh, occupational pensions. And at the other hand, we have Dean McClelland. He is CEO at the Tontine Trust with the revolutionary uh, Tontine business model. He is currently rolling out a pan-European pension product, also referred to as the PEP. And together with them, we will do the, the webinar. So how will it work? Um, first, Francesco will uh, introduce his uh, pan-European occupational uh, pension uh, idea. And then we'll pose some questions. If you want to pose any uh, any questions, feel free to uh, to drop them in the in the message box, and I will try to pick on pick upon them if it is possible within the time frame. Afterwards, uh, Dean will give his uh, 15 minute um, presentation, and then we will have a plenary session. And I hope again to uh, incorporate some of your uh, comments. The floor is uh, for you, uh, Francesco. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. And uh, so I prepared some uh, slides so that uh, you can have uh, an idea on, uh, on this PEOP project. Um, I hope you can see that. Yeah. Do you see the slides? Yes, Perfect. yes, very clearly. Thank you very much. So uh, let's start with this uh, presentation. So a PIOP uh, stands for a Pan-European Occupational Pension. And uh, uh, so here we, we can start speaking a little bit about the cross-border pensions in Europe according to the uh, current regulation. Actually, there are two possibilities at the moment so far to have uh, uh, cross-border pensions in Europe. The first uh, is the PEP. The PEP is a personal pension product. It is created at European level, so it's a kind of federal European pension vehicle. And uh, this is uh, quite, seems to be at least according to the legislation, uh, quite efficient because uh, it will uh, act basically under the same conditions uh, across the different EU member states and it is especially to be fully portable. Then uh, instead for the workplace uh, uh, pensions, so basically the occupational pensions, we have uh, the so-called IOP uh, directive. The IOP directive is uh, quite different because uh, first of all, uh, the pension funds uh, are only national entities. So they are uh, unlike the PEP, uh, are national uh, pension vehicles. And uh, there, is, there are some uh, issues because uh, uh, when there are cross-border activities with the IOPS, uh, there is, uh, um, it's mandatory to comply at least with the two legislations. One is uh, the legislation of the country where the pension fund is based, which is called the home country. And then uh, there is the legislation of the country where um, the company and the employees are based. So it's called the host country and the portability is not granted. Uh, you can see here a little bit how uh, if you put uh, in the center the country where the pension fund uh, in, in the case of cross-border activity of IOPS is based. So country A uh, in the center, and then you can see that around there are different compartments because, so in the countries B, C, D, and so on, imagine that country A is Belgium, and then the other countries are Germany, Italy, Ireland, whatever, you can see that uh, there are different jurisdictions uh, to comply with. 
And this, uh, of course, uh, might create uh, some complications. And you can see a little bit here the list of the critical issues of uh, the cross-border activities provided by the IOP directive, in particular the compliance with the social and labor regulation of the host state, uh, the taxation for sure, but also I would say uh, there is another problem which is very practical, but it is uh, very um, uh, widespread. It is the notification procedure. So basically, the, the pension fund which decides to set up a cross border activity. Excuse me, I have someone is uh, the my my uh, voice is coming back. Uh, notification procedures. So sorry, no, no problems. So a uh, notification means that uh, the, the different national authorities must uh, grant the notification, and sometimes this procedure takes a long time time and uh, there are sometimes also different uh, requests uh, so why don't we go beyond the uh, cr the cross-border activities of the iop directive and we do create a real EU, uh, eu european framework for a pan-european occupational pension a little bit like the pep but the, uh, would be the corresponding workplace version of the pep well, in such a case, we would have for sure some advantages, quite interesting. The first is that the PELP would really generate huge economies of scale because uh, there would be a kind of simultaneous compliance. Uh, sorry, we would avoid the simultaneous compliance with the national legislations, and instead we just would have to follow the European regulation and their requirements from the European regulation. Then uh, we would have the possibility to open up the competition between national pension funds and this uh, European vehicle, uh, especially in, in those states uh, where, they, for example, the workplace pensions do not really exist or where they do exist, but they are very expensive. And so uh, competition in such a case would be beneficial. And another big advantage, it is clear to everyone, uh, a pan-European occupational pension would ease the mobility of workers in the European Union with regards uh, to the acquisition and safeguard of their, uh, of their pension rights. And that would be very interesting, especially for the multinational companies having uh, different branches in Europe, they could easily move their workers from a country to another. And the last, but I would say not least uh, big advantage, would be that uh, such a, a pan-European occupational vehicle would really foster the financial industry in Europe because there would, there would be the possibility to create huge pension funds uh, operating in several countries uh, of Europe and so uh, also basically to, uh, to, to create, to generate huge and massive assets to be invested also in the European economy. By the way, this is a big problem in Europe because apart from probably the Netherlands and maybe a little bit with Britain, which is not even anymore a member of the European Union, our pension funds in Europe are very small are very small and uh, in general the assets uh, are fragmented in small pots so we don't do not have we cannot really compete for example with the big countries like the united states uh, or uh, even canada australia which have much bigger and much larger pension funds uh, and then uh, some features about this pelp well the first of all uh, who might might create the PELP, either employers, let's, I made the example of multinational companies, of course they could create themselves a PELP, or uh, pension providers like uh, insurance companies, pension funds of course, uh, asset managers. In such a case, uh, providers could create also multi-employer PELPs, in other, uh, in other words, they could create kind of master trusts, uh, and this kind of open PELPs uh, could be opened so also to, for example, small medium enterprises could join directly these platforms operating at cross-border level. Uh, again, uh, having the advantage maybe of uh, better and lower costs compared to their national products. 
Then another important feature is that the PEOP would be voluntary and alternative to the existing uh, national pension products, which means that it would cohabit with them, but uh, the national pension funds should not have to comply and to adapt their internal functioning to the PELP regulation. So basically, they would be free to operate the, as they do today. It's very different from the IOP directive. The IOP directive uh, is, obliges all the pension funds to adapt their functioning to the European directive. It would not be the case with the PEP. By the way, it's not the case also with the PEP because also the PEP is a voluntary second regime, we call it in the European legal language. And then, uh, like the PEP, it would be immediately authorized to operate in the different countries of the European Union. I said before that the procedures to get the authorizations for IOPS to, to uh, have the authorization to set up cross-border activities in some countries are still very complicated. Well, instead, the PELP would, uh, as a European product, would have uh, a passport. Basically, they should only inform the PELPs, the, the member states, where they want to create a local branch, that they are going there. Only information, not really authorization because it would be automatic. And uh, last, here, I would say that uh, uh, I think it's from fundamental, it would be fully portable. Not only portable, not only a PELP would be portable between its national accounts, so within the same PELP I could move in many other European countries and all, always take my, the money with me, but also if I decide to change, so between PELPs, I, I decide to quit my previous PELP, I decided to join a new PELP, I could immediately transfer my money to the new PELP of destination, which is also another huge possibility. And why not, it's something that we wrote in our reflection paper, also portability could be provider, provided between PELPs and PEPs. So it could be also, uh, would be also a possible channel to improve portability of pensions. Uh, other features of the PELP, well, first of all, no fee caps, that will be different with, uh, with a difference with the PEP, because we, we imagine that the PEP, I mean, the market would decide already the costs of the management and investments. So no thresholds are mandatory by the European legislation. We know, by the way, that the thresholds, the fee cap, is still a big problem with the tax. Um, the same rules on investing and waiting periods uh, and the treatment of dormant rights in all the European countries where the PELP would uh, act. Uh, and uh, especially for the uh, accumulation phase, the PELP would have the same rules on investments, uh, governance, uh, capital protection, so basically guarantees or capital protection in other ways, information to the uh, members, the users, but also reporting to the supervisory authorities, same rules, so possibility to work uh, in a harmonious way, homogeneous way across the European countries. Uh, in terms of solvency rules, uh, we mentioned like the PEPs that uh, the solvency rules would be basically the same European rules uh, applied to the different entities that would be enabled to create PEPs like the solvency rules uh, for the insurance companies, for asset managers or for pension funds. And then instead we would have uh, the PEP would be flexible in, for other aspects. So flexible meaning that it could be adaptable to the different member states, the different requirements or preferences of the member states. For example, about the amount of the contributions, I have to remind that it would be a DC uh, defined contribution pension product. So in terms of contributions, in terms of uh, guarantees on the capital and the investments, uh, that would be some, a, a choice uh, to much uh, cover the, uh, the guarantees. The payout options, of course, uh, in some countries, for example, uh, lump sums are basically the main rule for the payout, but in other countries, instead, annuities are still pre preferred. The coverage of biometric risks and, of course, the retirement age. So also would be also flexible in other aspects that would not undermine the smooth functioning of the PELPs during the accumulation phase. 
Uh, yeah, I have an, an example. It's a graphical example on how it's a, it's an important question, I think, on how the pair could cohabit and which kind of relations could have with the national pension products. So if the pair, let's say, is uh, the uh, light blue, the light blue here uh, on, the, on the graphic is a PELP, it could also act, uh, as you can see here, let's say if we take the state B, in the state B, a PELP is already covering the occupational pension of that company, of course, for that company, let's say. But in other countries, uh, state, state B or state C, uh, well, we can have a national occupational pension. How could it interact with the PELP? It could interact uh, um, by using, let's say, the PELP as a corridor uh, just to ensure portability. So, for example, if I am a member of a pension fund based in country A, a national pension of country A, and, I, and one day I decide to move to another country, I could join the PELP with which this pension fund makes an agreement with the PELP and they could move together with the PELP and of course I could transfer my money through the PELP to another country. So, I mean, the typical a good example would be the, the example of the member state D. You can see that, take a company. A company might have, let's say, a company which is mainly a Dutch company or an Italian company and the 80% of workers are based in those countries. So you can see on the layer on the bottom, you can have already your national pension of that company in those countries because the majority of workers are there. But then you have a 20% of workers who are instead located in other countries of the same employer. But in such a case, you would create a PELP because then you would cover the, the remaining 20% of your workforce with a PELP. And even if I instead the company has some mobile workers, instead of enrolling them in the national pension fund of that company, it could enroll them already in the PELP because those workers are very mobile according to the internal organization. So could be also flexible, let's say, and a good tool for portability. Uh, the taxation for sure, and I'm, I'm closing to the end, the uh, taxation for sure is the, the most challenging uh, part of the, of in general, pensions in Europe, because we know that uh, taxation is not a competent of the European Union, unless uh, we reach the unanimity of the member states. Here, the problem of the taxation of the PELP is not really the how much, because, I mean, every member state could decide how much taxation to apply and would not be really an issue. The real issue is when the taxation is required. And you know that in the member states, I mean, the taxation basically can fall on the contributions to the pension, on the returns on the investments. Usually it doesn't, but in some countries it also, uh, it also returns are taxed, or on the benefits. Uh, in Europe, we know that the, um, the most uh, spread formula is the EET formula, so exemption on, on contributions, exemption on returns and taxation on benefits. But some countries have a TEE formula and others like, for example, Denmark or Italy have a ETT formula. And you can imagine that when you do, I mean, when we have to adapt the taxation to the, to the different moments of the accumulation or the accumulation phase, you have also a problem to work smoothly across Europe. So um, ideally speaking, but it's only ideally speaking, an harmonized taxation formula would be the best. I would even prefer the TEE, honestly, because I would imagine that in a TEE system, the taxation on contributions would be immediately paid, paid, but then workers would be free to move to other countries and basically their, um, let's say, uh, situation with the local tax authority would be already settled. Um, but as for the moment, that would be quite complicated. We studied a possible alternative, and the possible alternative would be a kind of European centralized agency, a kind of a tax agency, a kind of hub. This hub would act as a filter, 
a filter between the PEOPS and the national tax authorities. Would be very interesting because basically the PEOPS would only interact with this uh, agency and uh, using this agency as the only interlocutor for their tax issues, then basically they would act as if the taxation formulas was harmonized in Europe because they do only respond to this agency. And then the agency, of course, would refund the uh, national uh, tax uh, authorities with the money of their own countries. Uh, I give you here an image on how it could look like. Maybe you can better understand from this chart. So you can see that uh, uh, on the on the top uh, there are the national tax authorities. They would interact with this decentralized new taxation agency here in the center of the graph. And then uh, from the bottom you can see that the PEP or e even the PEP could use the same agency or the PEOPS would only interact with the centralized taxation agency. Uh, that would be very interesting because we would not need to change anything in terms of legislation of the, the tax in Europe. Uh, countries would be following and keeping their taxation formulas, but PEOPS and PEPS would not be um, undermined by the different taxation formulas. Uh, I, just the final slide. Well, the final slide is a little bit the state of the art. So where do we stand? CBBA, so the organiz organization that I do represent, CBBA Europe, uh, prepared a reflection paper explaining how the PELP would look like. It's a kind of, it's a first legal study. It's a kind of feasibility study, maybe not so ambitious, but it's still a study. Uh, it's 60 pages, so it's, uh, it's quite legal, of course. And we started a campaign. Uh, we know, and we are very proud of that, that not only the European Union is aware of uh, this uh, project, but also last February, the ex exiting outgoing chair of EOPA, Mr. Bernardino, clearly stressed the need to have a new European legal framework for a pan-European -Euro occupational pension. Uh, for us, it was a big endorsement that EOPA really stresses this need. And uh, um, the, the condition for sure, and that's the reason why we are doing the campaign to the, have the EU starting working on this initiative is that several stakeholders will support the project. So basically the market appetite, for many stakeholders, be them employers, be them providers, advocating for that. And with this regard, uh, CBBA is in fact creating a coalition of stakeholders supporting this idea, stakeholders mainly based in Europe and the United States. And uh, uh, of course, if you are interested in this product, uh, we are sure it will come one day, but to speed up the project, um, you can, of course, join our uh, campaign. I thank you very much, and uh, I give you the floor uh, to uh, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for your insightful uh, contribution. I think that, uh, that especially um, on the point of payoffs with national occupational pensions, we have some questions uh, of the audience that I would like to pose to you. And although they were posed a bit earlier in your presentation, and I think that one way or the other you touched maybe briefly upon it, I think it's important to, to pose them. So uh, the first uh, question that we have is uh, whether the pay up is feasible given the protection of, uh, of incumbents yeah, so uh, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, what we wrote in our paper is that, uh, um, in, in principle, we have to be very clear, competition is good. We have to be very clear, competition is good. So ideally, ideally, in those countries where pension, occupational pensions are not mandatory, are not mandatory, like, for example, in the Netherlands, they are mandatory, collective agreements, sector-wide pension funds, the decree, uh, ministry decree of extension to make it compulsory to all the sector. Well, when they are mandatory, the PELP, of course, could not and should not interfere with the mandatory pension funds of those countries. 
So uh, that's that's for us granted. Uh, I use the Netherlands as an example because probably it is the most known example of mandatory pension funds. The system works very well. Netherlands has one of the best pension systems of the world. No one, uh, I mean, there is not even need to, cre- to, to, to dis- destroy uh, this system. At the same time, in many other countries, pension funds are not mandatory, are already in competition domestically. So why not? PEOPS could compete with them as well. I mean, if there is a free market, in such a case, PEOPS could also uh, compete with them. And uh, in, we have to be honest that in some countries, uh, pension funds are not really efficient. Uh, they're not really efficient because their costs and fees are very high. They are not very efficient because they are not always very transparent, even if they are not directly improved this kind of uh, uh, issues. And uh, in, in other countries, uh, there are not even basically pension funds. If we think about the Central and Eastern European countries, basically there are no occupational pensions. So why not to have, a, to have payoffs maybe created in Ireland, maybe created in Belgium, maybe created in France, covering those countries and offering to the local workers uh, occupational pensions. So in short, and to conclude, to answer your question, uh, the relation would be to not interfere on the national systems where the occupational pensions are mandatory, but for all those other, when there is room for competition, then PELPs for sure should and could compete with the local pensions. I see there are many questions uh, pouring in uh, for you, uh, Francesco. Maybe to have a really brief one, because uh, we have to be a bit uh, conscious of the time. What is now the status of the of the payoff in terms of development? Well, the, the state is that uh, the European Union is aware of the project. The EOPA, like I said before, recommend, I mean, the EOPA, the uh, outgoing president of EOPA, clearly recommended uh, the need of the European Union to proceed and uh, to, to start a legislation about the pan-European pension, occupational pension, so basically about what we call the PELP. We did this reflection paper, which is already in the hands of some European authorities. We are sending it out to, the, to others. The key is uh, the market appetite. So uh, maybe just to say, um, the European Union will take seriously into consideration the start of the PELP, so basically to work on the PELP, when they will have the feedback from stakeholders that the PELP is worth it. And that's a key. That's a key. Probably they will have right. a consultation, to be probably a consultation one day from the European Union, and they will ask, would you like to have a European legal framework for a a pan-European occupation of pensions and of course the answer should be yes, go ahead with that. Actually, uh, Francesco, great presentation. I I have about five or six questions myself uh, that I want to ask, but uh, uh, let me me get through our our one first. Um, Obviously, you know, the European Commission has done an amazing job of putting together the Pan-European Personal Pension Product, uh, which I personally believe sets the new gold standard for pensions, uh, not just in Europe, but across the world. Um, and I think this is a brilliant initiative uh, to be able to bring that level of governance and transparency, and in fact, innovation in pensions uh, to occupational pensions, as well as personal pensions. So I think it's a brilliant initiative. Um, and what I'm going to do today is essentially present uh, one of the innovations that uh, PEP allows, which we are confident that we can easily slot into a, uh, pan, a pan-European occupational pension so that everybody else can benefit. Uh, I can just put the screen up. Uh, I trust you can see that okay. Yes, this is very, uh, very well visible, Dean. Okay, great. Uh, so obviously, uh, you know, our firm is called Team Trust, uh, but, you know, we're here today to talk about uh, PEOPS. Um, one of the things that PEP has introduced is that it's, it's opened the door to a next generation of pension funds uh, for innovation 
Uh, innovation is not really a word that's associated with the pension sector. In fact, it's usually uh, looked upon with a high degree of mistrust. Um, but the, the reality is that innovation happens and PEP has enabled it in a very, very positive way. Uh, but in order for me to explain exactly what uh, uh, PEPs have now enabled, first, I'd like to explain the problem um, that needed to be solved uh, by the pensions industry. Um, and essentially, that problem is that, uh, you know, fundamentally, everybody, uh, all employees across Europe, you know, share the same goal. Uh, they want to work hard, save money, support their families, and hopefully save enough uh, so that when they get to retirement, they're going to be able to, you know, have a wonderful, relaxing time and, you know, enjoy their golden years. Uh, and this is what the pension system is designed to do. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as I found out in 2017, that dream is largely over for most people. Um, the way I found out about this was a very personal way. Uh, it happened to be that my mother and her friends revealed that they spend an inordinate amount of time worrying about running out of money in old age if they happen to live a long time. Um, so like any good and in former investment banker's son, uh, I went out looking to see if, I, if there's a solution for the problem. And I started to read that, uh, understand that this is actually a huge problem everywhere in the world. Uh, in fact, for savers over age over 55, running out of money in old age is actually now the number one fear. Um, and that's, you know, it, it, this is a situation nobody could have anticipated when DC uh, pensions were launched. Um, why, why are they so fearful? Well, the, currently what people do if they have a DC pension account is that when they reach retirement, they follow something called the 4% rule. And the 4% rule essentially is there to guide you towards making your savings last until you're about 90 years old. Uh, the problem with the 4% rule is that uh, if you're a 65-year-old man retiring today, you have a 33% chance of living beyond 90, in which case you have a 33% chance of running out of money. Uh, even worse, if you're a 65-year-old lady, you have a 44% chance of living into your 90s. So clearly the 4% rule is no longer going to work. So multiple uh, private pension providers around the world have carried out studies to try and understand what uh, savers actually want from a pension product if, you know, if the 4% rule is now obsolete. And what they've invariably found is that 84% of savers, they want an income that lasts a lifetime. Uh, they want that income to increase over time so that it rises faster than inflation so that their standards of living doesn't fall. And they want great value for money, which means low fees and a high income uh, for, you know, the, for their pension savings. Uh, unfortunately, this study, the main study that was carried out in 2017, the 100 insurers involved agreed that if a product has a defined benefit or a fixed rate of income, it's, it's absolutely impossible to make all the numbers work and deliver all the features that consumers want. However, there's been a huge movement around the world for the last few years, initially started in academia, uh, which has now been um, championed by policymakers, uh, where they're talking about creating risk-sharing pensions uh, because they enable higher income retirement. Uh, and by spreading the risk among, as a collective among savers, it means that you can manage the risk in retirement without the need or expense of a guarantee. So initially, the UK was first to jump on this bandwagon in 2018. Um, more recently, the OECD has come out and talked about the future of pensions. And they have devoted a whole chapter to explaining the advantages of tontines in that they can offer everybody a higher income in retirement and they can significantly reduce your risk in retirement by ensuring you don't run out of money. Um, and all of this is possible without the need for a guarantee from an employer or from an insurance company or from a government. Um, but most people in the world 
uh, unless you're uh, 200 years old, don't even want to know what a tontine is. Um, so let me give you a quick uh, explanation. Essentially what we're saying is that we'll get cohorts uh, of a same gender, similar age, for example, such as 60 to 65 year old ladies. Uh, they'll all accumulate uh, their pension funds into a, uh, a single closed pool. Uh, that money is then invested in a you know, highly diversified portfolio. Uh, it's not just invested in bonds, it can get exposed to long-term investments, uh, some equities, uh, green bonds. It can have a much more diversified, almost like an endowment fund portfolio, uh, as opposed to the old defined benefit uh, pension systems. Um, then what happens is that when all these ladies reach the age of 65, they're all going to start receiving a monthly income, which is pro rata to their contribution to the original pot. Um, by 20 years later, um, you've now got less ladies in the pool, uh, and, but the money is still there, which means that those surviving ladies are now receiving uh, higher incomes in retirement. And then by, by, for those ladies that end up living up to 95 or 100 years old, instead of running out of money and ending up on the street, um, the fund is now liquidating the capital as quickly as possible uh, to return it to the remaining members before they pass away. Um, and up, uh, as a result of all this means that the income increases over time. It's never going to run out of money. Uh, and actually, if you're one of the, the ladies that lives to the uh, into old age, uh, instead of having something to worry about, you're now having uh, the best healthcare money can buy. Uh, well, when you try and explain the concept like this to people for the first time, you know, they get very confused and they say, well, you know, this sounds a little bit unusual. You know, would people actually be interested in something like this? Well, historically, uh, tontines were created in, I think, 1653. Um, they were initially launched by the Dutch of all people. Um, and it was the first pan-European pension fund because it spread across the whole continent. Uh, and it led Adam Smith uh, to write in The Wealth of Nations that if a government ever wants to you know, issue a pension product, more money can always be raised by tontines by anything else. Uh, but it, it wasn't the only occasion. Uh, a little bit later, the USA read about tontines, about the European tontines, and they imported them and started offering them. And it absolutely transformed the US insurance industry. And uh, growing it by 600% within a single generation. You know, so these are blockbuster buster products that appeal to people. Um, but I guess the, the big question that everybody has is, you know, what, what, what is the nature of this appeal? What, why do they always have such a spectacular impact in any market in which they're launched? Uh, so if we think about normal pension products, um, it's not, they're not things that people generally get overly excited about. Uh, uh, you know, those that do save in the pensions are probably because they've been opted in as a result of legislation, uh, so they have to contribute, uh, or they're looking to reduce tax, and some of them are even actually planning on saving for retirement, but it's very much driven by law and tax at the moment. Um, if you look at another type of financial product that's in the market, uh, which is a lottery, uh, lotteries have no problem getting people to make vol voluntary contributions. And I, you know, nobody is out there complaining that people don't uh, spend enough on lotteries every month. Uh, but the reason people uh, put so much money, unfortunately, into lotteries is that they're driven by this behavioral science effect, which is um, that they, they overestimate their chances of receiving an outsized reward uh, for their contribution. Um, the thing is, this behavioral science effect is not all negative if we use it correctly, because essentially that's what's happening in a Tom T. Uh, the, you've got your regular pension product, which has, uh, you know, which is mandated by law, and it has the various tax advantages. But it, it also means that you now have this high degree of certainty that if you live into old age, instead of running out of money, actually you're going to be a benefit. Um, uh, to a large degree, uh, and you're going to have an amazing lifestyle in retirement. 
And this is what has always driven people um, to save as much as possible into their content pensions. Um, so it's interesting for us to try and quantify uh, what is the difference uh, between a taunting payoff uh, versus, for example, an annuity or following the 4% rule. And the, the difference is actually quite harsh uh, when, you, when you display it graphically. Uh, essentially, uh, the orange line represents the current value of an annuity in Ireland uh, for a million euros. Uh, that's what you can expect to receive. Uh, if you leave your money in the bank and just draw it down, uh, which many uh, retirees do now, uh, then you can expect to get about 3,000 a month for the rest of your life. But of course, that's going to run out um, when you reach your 90s. Now, on the other hand, if you pull your money into a Tom team, uh, the payments not only start higher than an annuity, um, and whilst they are variable over time, they tend to vary in a very positive direction as the number of members in the pool passes away. So if we talk about rolling out uh, tontine payoffs, you know, why would employers want to offer this? Um, well, essentially what they're saying is to their, their staff is that you know, we're here, we're offering you a lifetime income uh, until age 120. And for the employer, it adds no more costs and certainly no liability in more liability than if they were just offering a DC pension. Um, for the employees, um, they can expect that income in retirement is going to rise faster than inflation. Uh, the fact that the Tom Team payoff can invest in a broader spread of assets than just government bonds yielding 0%. Um, and the fact that there's no guarantee required means that there's, there's higher incomes in retirement as a result of better growth in the portfolio. And of course, the beauty of the payoff is that as designed, it's going to adhere to the PEP standards, which means that more or less, you know, that all that governance and transparency that's been mandated by PEP will now be made available for every worker of any country that's operating of course Europe. Um, and I think this is an amazing uh, innovation. So in summary, um, you know, we feel PEP has set a new gold standard for personal pensions. Uh, Tom Teens offer the missing lifetime income uh, pension benefit, which is what savers actually want. Uh, and on that basis, Tom Team payoffs can bring best-in-class protections, benefits, and portability to occupational pensions. Um, and I, for one, will be voting uh, to see this happen. So, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dean, for uh, introducing your uh, Tontine ideas and sharing this with us. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Uh, for the Tom time, what about surviving spouses who would expect to receive a survivor benefit? Um, so the, the, the best way to explain this is that I, I was speaking to a very senior gentleman in Deutsche Bank uh, recently, and he was saying that he expects to retire uh, with uh, a reasonably significant amount of capital. Uh, but the way he sees it is that he's going to take 25% of his uh, retirement amount, put it into his Tom team, 25% into uh, his wife's Tom team, and the remaining 50%, he's going to split between his kids um, now so that they can spend that money to start a business or buy a house. Um, so the, the reality is that uh, the spouse we would expect and certainly we would encourage people that uh, the, the, the person that has accumulated pension income, if it's one working spouse, uh, that they will divide that into an appropriate amount so that each of the spouses has their own individual uh, taunting pension for life. Thank you very much. I have another very uh, nice question from the audience for you. Why did Tontines disappear? That is the, my favorite question, I think. Um, the, essentially, the, in Europe, it, the governments were 
the government's got so addicted uh, to if issuing tontines that it was uh, emburdening the states with a, a product that was too good for consumers. And eventually, over time, they realized that actually, if they just offered bonds, uh, this is because tontines were invented and launched before the days of central banks, that they, if they just launched bond, bonds instead, that they could get away with uh, offering consumers much lower yields. Um, and obviously, if the governments can save money, they did. Uh, in the US, after they were launched over there, the insurance companies uh, launched the products. Um, and there was such an overnight success that everybody went for broke to try and get as big as possible, as fast as possible, paying the highest commissions. And as it, to pay these highest commissions, they, they started charging obscene levels of fees. Um, and there was a huge investigation 40 years into the Tonsin pension industry. And they found out that the insurance companies back then, in the pre-regulation days, had been mismanaging the assets, uh, tampering with the membership ledgers of the Tontines to favor family members, um, and generally just behaving very badly. Um, and there was a whole set of rules brought in in the US, which uh, prevented insurance companies from exploiting Tontine members with fees that they didn't really need to be paying in the first place. And effectively, it destroyed the profitability of the Tontine pension industry for the insurance companies. And as a result, they tended to switch back to selling annuities, which are a far more profitable product, um, not nearly as consumer friendly um, as a pure Tontine, if managed correctly though. All right, I see uh, there are, uh, we have still uh, 10 minutes, I think. Um, Another question that come up came up is like, is there some kind of critical group size uh, to uh, run such a uh, ton time? Um, well, if we, if we think about uh, a situation that everybody else is already familiar with, if you, know, if you, if you reach retirement and you have 100% of your portfolio uh, invested in a single asset, a single stock, you know, that's a pretty risky bet that you're taking for your retirement. Even by just splitting that portfolio into two different assets, you've already now reduced your risk. And hopefully, if you're receiving the right advice, actually you're going to split that into hundreds, if not thousands of assets um, to protect yourself. Um, the, same, the same sort of logic applies in the Tom T. As soon as you uh, pull your risk with one other person, you've reduced your risk. Uh, the more people you pull with, the more you're reducing that risk. Um, but what we found is that the numbers for each cohort start working beautifully above 300, uh, above 1,000. They don't get terribly better. Um, but actually what we do is we, um, we tend to cap the pools at a size of 10,000. And that is purely for a gamification effect. You know, we want Francesco to, uh, to get himself down to the gym every morning and you know, train as hard as possible and eat the right foods because we want him to believe that he's going to be the one that lives to 105, 110, uh, to, you know, to get the best benefit out of the Tom T. Um, so, you know, anything that we can do that maximizes uh, better behavior uh, of the Tom T members, such as eating better, exercising more or saving more, you know, uh, that's it's, the behavioral science all contributes and drives that. All right, thank you very much. At the end of your answer, there came really quite some uh, uh, some questions in. Maybe a nice uh, a nice question uh, that uh, for, for for Francesco also in this respect. Who would regulate uh, how the how the ton time pool is invested, uh, Francesco? In your, would it have any place in your in your payout proposal? Well, uh, about the investments, uh, <clears throat> basically we are really following. Uh, uh, we we did follow in our reflection paper the approach that was already taken in part from the IOP directive and in part from the PEP regulation. 
So uh, uh, basically, for example, when you think about investment options, uh, we mentioned to have uh, uh, a limited number of investment options, uh, say six, just to, re to really to uh, a little bit get inspiration from uh, the PEP regulation. Um, two of those uh, investment options uh, would be uh, either guaranteed on the capital or anyway, there would be a protection of the capital uh, through uh, risk mitigation techniques. Uh, the others, of course, uh, would be more uh, offered and uh, up to the uh, PEP provider uh, to be chosen by the potential uh, users. And then uh, the, I would say the main rules about investments would be the general ones about the prudential and, um, the person, prudent person rules and, and so on. Then, like I said, anyway, uh, it depends also on the um, sectoral uh, legislation because uh, we know that uh, an asset manager and an insurance company and the NIORP have, they, they could set up PELPS, but they would be still un uh, regulated by their uh, respective uh, sectoral legislation. So that's exactly the same approach that uh, has been taken for the PEPs. And uh, we will not see a reason to create uh, new rules uh, on the top of that. Another question which uh, you answered in written form, but which I think is plenary also uh, interesting with respect to the, the pay-up, is like, uh, if an, uh, in what way does a pay-up differ from a contract based PEP, so an, employ, um, an employer organized PEP? Well, I think um, I would say that the difference is the same as we can have between an IOP and a personal pension product. Uh, if uh, we assume that an IOP is different, so basically an occupational pension is a different from a personal pension product, we know that uh, according, uh, first of all, uh, to the uh, national legislations and the approach uh, in the uh, IOPS, uh, the employer and the employee, they both contribute into this pension vehicle. Uh, we know that uh, usually or very often um, ta the taxation, the treatment of the taxation between uh, second pillar pension and third pillar pension is different. And I would imagine, and uh, I would even guess and hope that uh, uh, the payout would be considered and fiscally also as a second pillar pension. Uh, and so it would have a different fiscal treatment, uh, I would say better than a third one. And then um, also in terms of governance, we know that in some countries, uh, I would say in France, in Italy, in Belgium, also, of course, very much in the Netherlands, in the Scandinavian countries, the governance and governing bodies uh, sometimes uh, provide for uh, bilateral participation from workers and employers' representatives. And that would be possible in a flexible structure like uh, the PELP, it would be possible that the governing bodies would accept the participation also of workers' representatives. It would not happen with uh, um, a personal pension product. So I, I will see that there is a, a, the PELP should not destroy, let's say, the um, nature and the cultural background of the European occupation of pensions. It should be an added value, but should not completely destroy the tradition and the, the way how those uh, occupational pensions work in Europe. And I think on these features, uh, we, we would be absolutely in line because the PELP vehicle would be able to offer all these kind of solutions. Well, thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for highlighting these differences. I think uh, we are slowly turning to the one hour session. I would like to, to finish uh, this uh, session by having a uh, very um, thoughtful question for Dean. Are Pontines not exacerbating the growing generation wealth gap and therefore socially questionable? Um, well, actually, there's a couple of aspects to that. Um, 
Uh, and, and I would call that a hospital pass uh, question at the end, by the way, Sebastian. Uh, but actually, it's, a, it's another great question. Um, th there's two aspects. Um, the, right now, there's, there's a perception uh, that, you know, my parents are going to live into old age. They're going to reduce their spending over time. There probably won't be any inflation. So, you know, they're not going to need to spend that much. And they're going to leave me 50, 60, 80% of their pension. Um, but the reality, if you do the math, is that there's a high possibility that these parents are going to live another 30 years in retirement. Um, inflation does happen. Um, so there's going to be course increases. Um, so the, the, the perception that there's a benefit, uh, there's a huge pot of money that's waiting around when your, par when your parents pass away is completely false. The reality is the, what you're going to be left with is the liability. Um, and in Europe, it's not, it, it, you know, it's a social problem that you have to, you've got to take care of your parents, of course. Uh, in the US, it's a legal problem uh, because people that, uh, if your parents are in a retirement home and they run out of money, the retirement home can keep them there and sue you to pay the fees of the retirement home. Um, you know, that's, that's not pleasant. Uh, the reality is that if you take care of your parents and they live a long time, you are going to be taking care of them when they run out of money. Uh, the Tom team prevents that. Uh, it's a solution that provides for a risk-sharing mechanism that makes sure it doesn't happen. Uh, but if I can, there's one other aspect to that question. Uh, if you look at um, many pension systems that are out there, they're using the monies, and certainly uh, in the U.S., uh, the state pension schemes, the state occupational pension schemes are using the money of workers today to support the pension payments of those that have retired already. Um, that is ridiculous because it is completely unsustainable. And that is uh, intergenerational theft um, because the, that money is just not going to be there to pay those younger workers when they retire. Um, that is the case in 49 out of 50 states in the U.S., uh, the one remaining state, the one state with a fully funded pension scheme is Wisconsin, and their state employee uh, pension fund is the only one that's 100% fully funded. And why? Because they operate it like a tonton. Um, so I think, uh, I think the questioner is right to bring up the subject of uh, intergenerational uh, theft or transfer, uh, but actually tonton is a solution. Um, they are the answer to prevent this, and it needs to be implemented as quickly as possible for the exact reasons that the person has uh, stated. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, that we uh, slowly have to uh, bring the conference to an end. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the audience for attending today. I hope uh, that uh, we could answer most of your questions. There's uh, one, one last question, whether you could receive the presentations, uh, at least of, of one of the speakers. Uh, I received confirmation that uh, I'm allowed to send out a presentation in PDF form if I receive after the conference uh, another confirmation, and I'm happy to, um, to circulate these. Uh, you would, for that, would need to circulate uh, an email to my uh, professional email address uh, that can be found widely on the internet, I think, then I'm happy to, to uh, circulate, uh, circulate that to you if I receive the permission. Uh, I think we also try to record uh, the conference today. If that managed out well, it might also be possible that we are able to uh, to uh, to bring it on the internet uh, so that you can rewatch it or share it uh, with anyone um, with whom you would like to share it. All right, thank you very much and uh, have a good day all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye.